Hey guys, Terrence here again from Neptune Systems with another episode of Let's Talk Reef. Thanks for joining us, those that you're in here. Um, we got a little bit of a slow start. I don't know if we've got the, uh, I think there's some baseball thing going on or something. Who cares about that? We're doing fish and corals. I mean, what could be more important? Anyway, for those of you that joined me so far, you know, thanks for coming. We've got both Facebook and uh, YouTube here. We do this every other week. This week, we've got a really special guest that I'm bringing in for you guys. It's Matt Peterson. He's a Masno Award winner, master breeder. This guy has been doing it forever, and he's got the beard to show it. So we're going to bring him in in a little bit. We're just going to talk about a couple of things first, kind of go over uh, what's been happening lately. First of all, let's talk about where we've been because we've been just about everywhere uh, in the country or one section of the country or another all uh, year long and we're kind of winding down now we have a few left you can see them on the chart there but we just got back from Reefa Palooza in Chicago oh my gosh what an amazing event um, I didn't know what to expect because it is the first year that we're doing Reefa Palooza in Chicago or they are doing it uh, so we went in just like we go into every one of our events we brought everything in put up the big booth um, and all of our gear was out there and the best uh, the best part of the booth at this place the tank amazing job a new way of aquatics up in uh, Minneapolis drove down six and a half hours just to set up this tank for us and I have never seen anything like it it was a I don't know about a hundred and twenty gallon tank and it probably had I don't know some people estimated thirty thousand forty thousand dollars worth of coral in there there were scoli gardens in there that each one of the scolies on it were, I don't know, $4,000, $5,000 a piece, a complete collector's items, all of them. Um, Doug from, uh, from New Wave Aquatics was getting asked the entire event, are those for sale, are those for sale? Not just from anybody, but like Vic from Worldwide Corals was over there bugging him to try to buy some of these corals. So these things were the hottest things in the show. I encourage you to go out and look at some of the online stuff that's happening, all of Richard Back's videos. I know he featured it a little bit, uh, but this tank was amazing. Jen came in, set the whole thing up. They brought everything in from Minneapolis. They brought the tank in. They brought the rock in. They brought uh, all the corals in, of course, all the gear in, and uh, we put an apex on it. They set the whole, all the water, too. Uh, the, even the anthias, they uh, had Bartlett's anthias. They had like a 30 uh, fish school of Bartlett's anthias that they had conditioned for about 30 days just so that they would school together and look really amazing in this tank. Also had a gem tang in there and I can't remember what the other fish were but just this thing was unreal. You got to go out and look for it. Glad to see we got more and more people rolling in here. Like I said, who cares about baseball? We got the usuals here from Derek Picker and Joe Rosano. Uh, Todd Boss Hog White, that's a good name. Thanks for joining us. You guys start warming up your questions because uh, we're going to have somebody on here who can answer all your fish breeding questions. I can guarantee you that. Um, Joe's asking when's next year's schedule going to be posted. Uh, probably in the next Let's Talk Reef or maybe the one after. I'll have some of the dates for some of the events next year. Um, I think uh, Derek saw the display. He says best display ever. Uh, definitely, gosh, I. I, they really set the bar. Every show we go to, the bar gets set higher and higher. I think it started really uh, with Manhattan, Manhattan Aquariums, and then uh, LAX started, uh, uh, you know, put, put together an amazing tank. And uh, just on and on and on. We had Top Shelf down in Orlando this year, uh, and now uh, these guys from New Wave. Uh, so, Rap Chicago, big, uh, big win for us. Uh, big win for all of you that went because it was amazing. One more thing to talk about is our Control Freak Wednesdays. We do those every other week. We had Matt Dudley uh, last uh, Wednesday. He had an incredible tank, so many fish, great corals, lots of insight into how he does things. You can learn a lot from uh, all of these Control Freaks out there. So join us for Control Freak Wednesdays every other Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, adjust that for wherever you are in the country and come learn about what some of your other fish friends are doing with their uh, apexes and their aquariums. Okay, so uh, we already have Kevin Taylor asking us, that didn't take long, when's the Trident released in the UK? Soon, very soon. Everybody here in the US is telling me not to send them to you guys over there because they want them here. Just kidding, we're working on getting them set up to go over there, it won't be long now. Okay, so the, uh, the next person that I'm going to bring in 
this is him actually giving a talk in front of, uh, you know, this Neptune-sponsored banner at Magna, of course. And there you see him. I, I don't know if he'd say that's his, his best picture, but I'll tell you what. This is him. This is Matt uh, coming in for, uh, with his family. Look at this. Is this not the greatest? This is a picture of Matt. You know why? This is three-quarters good because it's three-quarters not Matt. Just kidding. I'm going to bring Matt in now. Let's, let's, uh, let's see what Matt's got to say about me joking around with him. Oh, wait a second. I got to joke a little bit more. So he likes all of this uh, freshwater stuff. So we've got to keep him from talking about this. Before he can even see this stuff roll up, hopefully, I'm going to show you these ugly fish. Hey, don't be too offended out there, guys. I know there's great looking freshwater fish. But he sent me a bunch of these pictures. And I'm like looking through those going, I'm not going to talk about some dinosaur, pleco, whatever, and a bunch of guppy looking things. These people want to talk about marine fish and marine corals. So we're going to talk about that stuff. So, you know, without further ado, I'm going to bring in, let me get, uh, let me get Matt Peterson here. Welcome to the uh, Let's Talk Reef live stream, Matt. Thank you for having me, Terrence. This is awesome. And uh, yeah, I know, you know, freshwater fish, I don't discriminate. I, I like them all. If they swim, I like them, mermaids included. Okay. All right. Well, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the freshwater stuff, I have seen some beautiful freshwater stuff. I have, I have to say. Um, and people get on me and have got on me before because I've been at local fish stores and whatnot. And I've, I've, I've kind of said some things about freshwater. And I've said some things to you about freshwater. So um, they're just going to have to forgive me because I'm, not, I'm nothing of a freshwater guy. Uh, you know, it's... There's there's so much to this this world. Enjoy it all and uh, just do whatever you like. That's that's my bottom line. So, okay. So uh, so Matt, let's get a little bit of an intro from you, some background and whatnot. Um, tell us about you, how you started in uh, in being a, a fish guy, and and how you ended up where you are now. In uh, I don't know, eighteen point six seconds. No, really, maybe a minute, minute and a half. Give it. Yeah. Give so us some um, my parents gave me a fish tank. Uh, my brother and I a fish tank when. For Christmas one year, I think I was five, and uh, I was the one who stuck with it. Um, and by ten, I had my first saltwater tank. I had a French angelfish and uh, uh, a cinnamon clownfish and a ten-gallon tank, which obviously we would never recommend now, but you know it was a long time ago. Um, and as soon as I could get a job in the pet industry, I got a job in the pet industry. And uh, the first store I ever worked in, I wasn't legal to work for them. Technically, I was thirteen. But it was just taking care of their animals, um, that kind of stuff. And then uh, the second place where I worked retail for a few years, he wasn't hiring. I walked in and I said, hey, I see this, uh, this saltwater system you have. It's not up and running. If I get it working, will you give me a job? And he said, yeah. And I spent a Saturday there, got the system up and running, and worked there for several years. And uh, kind of went up through the retail ranks, uh, running fish departments, uh, doing maintenance. Is this all uh, in Minnesota? No, this is actually all in Chicago. Um, okay. We only moved to Minnesota about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, ended up go just kind of going higher and higher up the, the retail uh, mm -hmm. food chain, if you will, and um, doing maintenance. Uh, eventually, uh, while I was going through college, uh, I ended up working for a hatchery and wholesaler, and then... Um, uh, had another stint back in retail a little bit later, did some importing. So what did you go to college for? I went to college for uh, multimedia communications, what we're doing right now. Oh, I excellent. Not, I, I went to school for marine bio briefly. I wanted to study uh, marine aquaculture. And I met with the advisor. There was no mariculture or marine aquaculture program at the school I was going to. And I said, you guys do independent studies. I want to do an independent study. Uh, on this topic and he said well talk to me when you're a senior I said I'm paying you forty thousand dollars a year or you'll talk to me now that didn't go over well and uh, I left and ended up in the internet world and for, okay. a, for a number of years and even still I mean this is my my bread and butter is really interactive software development interactive marketing digital marketing um, and so it all kind of has come together so and and now you've you're, you've been doing uh, fish breeding for quite some time, right? So, what I mean, what was that? What what fascinated you, or what still fascinates you about reef breeding, uh, in that part of the hobby? Well, when I was a kid, I, I marine breeding was not a thing. 
Um, I we one of the pictures I sent over was Joe Lichtenbert. And so he was based in Schaumburg, Illinois. And when I was a member of the Chicago Land Marine Aquarium Society as a kid, these guys would say, hey, you know, there's this guy in Schaumburg breeding clownfish. And I said, that's that's really cool. And I'd love to do that at home. But I was I, I think I was 13 or 14 or maybe 15 at that point. I couldn't drive out, had no idea who this guy was. Um, but even in some of the books from the 70s, there he is. Um, some of the books from the 70s uh, will talk about spawning fish, breeding marine fish. And, and for some reason – Doing something that's hard and challenging, um, that kind of spoke to me. I like a challenge. A little so, bit of a god complex, huh? No, not a god complex. <laughs> just doing something. Try to do something that no one's done. You know, I mean, that's uh, you see in the the entire freshwater world that a lot of aquarists grow up in. Uh, if you really stay in that lane, breeding becomes a way of life. It's the next fish to breed, the next challenge. Sharing your fish is much in the same way we. have frag corals and pass them around among our friends. It's a lot of challenges. I mean, it's just a challenge because it hasn't been solved yet. And so it's almost competitive. It, it, well, it's self-competitive because there's no one else oh, at come the time. On now. You know it's it. competitive with your peers. You know, I think somewhere in here, right, there's the, the big purple monster or whatever of all the names of all of these. And you know part of the reason that you do this is to, to, to get it competitive between all your peers, right? Well, that's that's what the uh, this thing right here, the MBI, that's what that's about. Um, okay. That's about courage and competition because competition uh, just fosters innovation and advancement. I so, agree with you 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, but for me, it was trying to do something that no one else had done. Um, that was really uh, – that's like why I bred the Harlequin Filefish. That okay. was – see if I can keep this obligate coral, coral ivor alive. I know uh, Kevin talked about him a few weeks what, ago. Rewind. I, I missed that. Uh, right over the top of it. That's why I bred the what? Harlequin filefish. I didn't send oh. you any pictures of those, but um, orange spotted filefish. Kevin uh -huh. was talking about those a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I've not produced many of them, but that was something that no one else had done. And the the rush of adrenaline you get when you have them eating or have them spawning for the first time, um, let alone getting babies and then rearing them, it was just incredible. It was a, an, incre a, an incredible amount. Each one of the steps that you get through and that you cross that border. And then when you finally cross, uh, you know, a, 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 a milestone that somebody hasn't crossed yet, you exactly. think it's possible that you might make it all the way to the finish line. You don't know if you're going to run out of steam or not, but you've at least passed farther than the last guy. When you're trying to do something new, no matter what it is, there can be an incredible amount of failure. And you, one of the things I talk about when I go talk about marine fish breeding and trying to do something new is you have to be willing to stomach a lot of failure. But it makes the success so much sweeter. Of course. So, yeah. But I mean, the the competitive guy in me, though, right? It's kind of these are these are contrast or you know contradicting forces here, right? Because you're finding out how to cross that next milestone or the one after that, yet the other guy is out there also doing it. How do you then? Well, gee, we want to share, but I don't want him to be first. Well, I mean, it's so hard to be first at this point. I mean, we've got. 400 species or it's 399 officially that have been spawned and reared at least once in captivity that's out of 1500 to 2000 so most families have been done most species have been done there's very little that hasn't at this point just in the last 15 20 years okay. um we're, we're at this point now where it's okay we bred yellow tangs can we apply that to purple tangs and maybe gem tangs and then maybe scopus or something else okay. and, and kind of we're at this rinse and repeat stage. There's very little where we don't have at least one example of how to do it. Um, if you want to breed Antheus, the information's out there. There's 50, 100 species of Antheus you can go pursue, and maybe you'll be the one to do it. Um, that's kind of where we're at now. I see. Uh, but back in the day, it was a Wild West, and it was, you know, it's 2,000 fish. Pick one that hasn't been done. And uh, the odds are there's so few marine fish breeders who are willing to dedicate the time that it takes that you still are likely going to be doing something no one else is doing unless you're picking something uh, rather routine. Okay. That's so we'll get into a little bit of that. So uh, I'm going to kick, kick this off this way, this kind of set of questions and trying to get some information out of you. Um, I remember when I had uh, my 210-gallon tank, I also had a little nano tank, and that little nano tank had a couple of clowns in it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my wife loved that little tank, okay? And but that tank always got warmer because it had no real cooling on it. it you know, it was it was one of those uh, 
you know, BioCube kind of things, right? Yeah. And so it was yeah. always at like 82, 83, 84 degrees. And all of a sudden one day I go, oh look, there's little eggs down there on the corner of the thing. And immediately, immediately, my wife's like, oh my gosh, we have to raise them. We have to, we have to get them. We have to do something with them. Can't we do something with them? What are we going to do? They're going to grow up and then what's going to happen to them? Are they going to live in there? I'm, and I'm like, no, they're probably just going to, they're going to hatch and then they're going to go in the overflow and die or they're going to get eaten or something else is going to, we can't let that happen. Call somebody, have them come and get them. And I think this is a very common, um, uh, you know, early hobbyist thing that people go through. Um, I, you know, all of us, of course, I'm kind of making fun of my wife a little bit, but I mean, I see all sorts of things happening in my tank. The shrimp, right? I see little cleaner shrimp having the same thing. I'm like, oh man, I gotta yeah. save some of those. Those things are like 15 bucks, 25 bucks a piece. I, I, sure, I can raise a couple, you know, and there's something. So, I mean, first of all, I think, I, how plausible is it for the average hobbyist to, to, that has these clowns, that saw them laying eggs, obviously the way they did it is probably not right. Maybe we can talk about that, but how plausible is it for them to then, you know, go forward and say, yeah, I'd like to give this a shot and raise, you know, some baby clownfish? Okay, so that first batch that anyone ever has, that's a lost batch. Don't even worry about it. Um, it's kind of like the warning shot that, hey, if you want to do this, it's time. And that can mm -hmm. take a couple years with any, uh, some of the clowns take three to four years to hit maturity. So you could be sitting on a good, healthy pair of clowns and they do nothing for a long time. But that first batch, you're not prepared. It requires dedicated equipment, uh, dedicated time, sp uh, special tools. You can't, you can't rush out and be like, okay, let's do this right now, unless you have a lot of money. If you want to throw money at the problem, uh, you could certainly make a go of it your very first time. Um, okay. But the way I look at breeding is to kind of get prepared in it ahead of time. So even if you're, whether your clowns are spawning or not, You'll give them a tile, a, a, pl a place where they can lay their eggs that you can remove it so you're okay. not trying to so let, catch so let's, people. Let me, if I can, I rewind and summarize some of this. So your clowns sure. have already found out that however you have your tank configured, they like to breed and they have eggs and they lay them on something, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're like, okay, I think I'm going to take this on. I went out and read a bunch of stuff for Matt, and the first thing I need to do is I need to put a, a tile in here. And is this just like any tile you can get, like sample tile from Home Depot? Yes, yeah, ceramic, uh, just white ceramic. Porcelain that ceramic tile. tile. Okay, yep. so you go get one of those, like a three inch by three inch or a two inch yeah, or what? Square, square piece, bigger, you know, whatever you can get them to lay on that's removable. Okay. That is uh, replicable. So they, a lot of clownfish breeders use terracotta pots, uh, flower pots that are cut in half. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, and, and the whole point is you can just go get a whole bunch of them, clean them up, uh, make sure there's no pesticides on them. Uh, you can take a tile saw, cut them right in half, and you got this little clownfish home. And then when they lay their eggs in the rated hatch, you just take out the home and you put in a carbon copy that's exactly the same. Um, the only other option is to try and catch the babies when they hatch out of the tank, and that's a real hassle. You can try something like uh, Chad Boston's larval snagger. Um, you can try light collecting and siphoning them out, but it's, uh, it's much more efficient to have a substrate you can just remove. Um, so if that's that's – one of the things that takes time, a lot of times the clownfish, if they're laying on a piece of live rock, maybe it's really because hard. clownfish to are different than a lot of other um, fish who free swim and spawn, right? Yeah, they're not they're not pelagic spawners. They're demersal spawners. So they, they lay their eggs. Look at that. I learned a word. <laughs> they, they lay their eggs on the substrate. They protect them. Um, whereas okay. something like a coral beauty just goes up in the water column, sheds eggs and sperm everywhere, and everything just drifts off. So the person um, they get on the they get on the tile right, and then they mm -hmm. got to take that tile out of the water. Is it okay to take it out of the water, or they got to like leave it in water oh, yeah. when they take it out? No, you can transfer it over no problem. But we're we're kind of getting ahead of uh, okay. ahead of ourselves. So you have to clownfish are one of the easier fish to rear. I like to call them the marine uh, guppies uh, okay. because anyone can do it at this point. Um, the real key uh, aspects uh, the first foods uh, and clownfish are rotifer feeders as a first diet we have really thanks to reed mariculture we have rotifer culture nailed down to make it super easy if someone wants to culture rotifers you can hop on with reef nutrition reed mariculture get a kit get frozen or liquid algae paste so you don't have to rear algae um 
and then you just need to get your rotifer culture routine down. Um, it's one of those things that you, you can run out, you can crash, um, but there's no, there's no easy way to just, you can't just order a million rotifers every day costs a lot of money and it's not, it's not economically worth it. You have to culture your own rotifers. So I, so, I, I I'm putting up a picture right now of the Jay Hansen's little setup there. Is that like what an average person would have or? So I, I, as soon as I see the picture, I'll tell you, but I think well, it's you that. You know, with the bucket, it's on a table, yeah, yeah. it's got so, a bottle of so, phytoplankton. It looks like that he's making out of it next to it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's for a single batch. That's a he used a green round tub. We like black round tubs. It's just a good larval environment for a lot of marine fish. Um, but he was using frozen algae paste. And then somewhere else in this room, he had a couple five gallon buckets full of rotifers. And he was culturing rotifers. That little green uh, cylinder you see next to the larger muck bucket mm -hmm. is a rotifer sieve. So he'll just harvest rotifers, pour them through the sieve, uh, and then rinse them off into that bucket with the larval fish. And the only filtration on that bucket is that there's no filtration. There's just an air stone that's circulating the water internally. Um, you hatch the babies in that container, and they spend the first week or two of their lives in that container. And um, I'm gl very oversimplifying it there, but it sure, is that of course. Simple. I'm not asking you to give the play-by-play, -play, but yeah. in, in general, I mean, it, it, you know, you give people a really good idea of what's involved, right? And, you know gear and time and whatnot, right? So you got to have some place to have them. You're going to have to make some phytoplankton. You're going to have to grow some uh, uh, some rotifers, and you're going to have to harvest them at different stages of their life, the rotifers, or are they all the no, same? No, they're all the same size. And realistically, uh, some, like Ocellaris and Percula clownfish, they need rotifers for the first four or five days of their life, and you continue feeding them after. But you can pretty quickly get them onto Otohimi uh, or uh, the TDO. Uh, so they don't from... have to have like baby brine shrimp in between, or it, it helps with with clownfish. It doesn't hurt, but they don't need it anymore. We've kind of figured out that you can start out on the smallest pellet size, and usually get them to transition over onto that, and then just eliminate brine shrimp altogether. Brine shrimp are kind of like the scourge of marine breeding because they bring in bad bacteria. They don't have the right nutritional profile. That's what um, I heard, and I I mean I've heard. Like you got to do that and this, and then there's all these steps, and so that's really interesting to me because I've always heard you got to do, okay, you got to get the rotifers, and then you got to have the baby ones, and then a little bit bigger ones, and then, but no, okay. No, not for clowns, not for clowns. Many other fish. Of course, yeah. for other fish, yes. I know that there's like many stages in the other fish. But I'm talking about even for clowns. I'm just sticking with yeah, clowns, clowns for people because I think this is where most people. I mean, there's a lot of fun talk we can have about stuff that a very small percentage of people can probably relate to, but clownfish is something I think especially early um, uh, hobbyists, you know, really can relate to. Clowns are the gateway drug. Yeah. 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 Speaking of uh, gateway drugs, right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about, uh, what about this lightning maroon or clown or lightning clown? I think I've got one of them on the screen here. I, I can't ever tell all the patterns or anything, but it's a it's the it's a, one of the ones you sent me that's got all the speckles and white and everything all over it. Oh, that that one's actually a, a frostbite, but frostbite. Um, See, what do yeah. I know? Yeah. Um. So lightning maroon. I mean, it's tell just us that a story. What was that? Tell us the lightning maroon story. Okay, so lightning maroon was a aberrant maroon clownfish caught in Papua New Guinea um, by the Sea Smart program. It was the second one they've found, um, and. To make a long story very short, it wound up in my possession. It was the most expensive fish I ever bought. I remember talking with my wife about it, saying, this is crazy. And uh, if you say no, I won't do it. And she said, I, I trust your judgment. We did it. Um, and then it was a, it was a roll of the dice genetically. It was, no one knew how it worked, what it was. It, it could have just produced a bunch of regular maroon clowns, and that could have been the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, we got lucky. It's a, it looks like a dominant uh, gene. So... If you made a lightning maroon to a regular white striped maroon, you get um, – or might be partially dominant. In any, in any case, it's not a recessive gene. It didn't take a lot of breeding detective work to figure out that it would pass along to the offspring. But it's literally just one gene that changes how the striping pattern forms. There you go. Those are um, yeah, those are babies. The, the patterning will break up in those ones that you're showing at Live Aquaria um, over time as the fish grows. Um, but it's a, it's a maroon clownfish. It just has one different gene. That's it. Um, so it was, it was a, uh, there's an entire you had to lightning. You two of them somehow, right? Well, no, because it's a, it's a single gene and it's, uh, either partially oh, dominant yeah. or dominant. Yeah. So 
it's going the 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 fish that has it is going to pass it along, and it's going to show up in a certain percentage a certain of the percentage, offspring. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, we actually I, I did lightning lightning crosses with the F ones, and we still got some uh, white stripes, which is a possibility. I'm leaning towards dominance on the gene. I bet other people who've continued to work with the fish could probably tell me exactly what it is. You know, someone like uh, Sea and Reef, uh, they were the first ones to really take uh, a single fish that they got from me and commercialize that fish, and now. I think every producer is producing lightnings and so, hybrid lightnings. So but. when you so when you got it, you bought your initial fish. Can you tell us how much you paid for it? No. Oh man, that's confidential, man. Sorry. <laughs> I signed it in red red blood. <laughs> you want to try it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Everybody wants to try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, so you get. You can't say how much you paid for it. Um, that's a fish I probably will Seventeen thousand dollars. Um, now, what's the seventeen? The highest public, I can tell you that the highest publicly known bid was seven thousand. Okay. So, I did, not saying anything else. That wasn't my bid. Okay. Um, so yeah. more so, north of seven thousand dollars. I didn't say that. Um, I did not <laughs> say that. But it was a lot of money. It was it was not a normal amount of money to spend on a fish okay. for a person who's you know I'm I'm not uh, I'm I'm perfectly well off but so how did you how did you uh and then so you get it in how long does it take till you start getting baby fish from this thing i want to say it took like a a good solid year year and a half before we got there Um, breeding clownfish is easy well once you get them breeding it's easy but they take time to mature okay so uh, like a percula clownfish takes about three years to become a female they're all uh i think most people know at this point the general biology of a clownfish they're born sexually inactive males, basically, and then the dominant one in a group or a pair becomes the female. But it seems for Percula that three, sometimes even four years is how long it takes, whereas to be a male that's viable as a, as a functional male only takes like eight months. So some people will cut down the timeline by either buying a, a breeding pair of fish from someone else or getting one from a friend who's had them a couple of years, or they'll buy a single adult and pair it with a young one that they want and cut down on that time but clownfish even even the fastest clownfish take a year to a year and a half to mature got it uh, so you have that you have that that time if you go buy tiny captive bred clownfish you're going to be waiting a little while before they're spawning it's not going to happen overnight so how many fish did you get to start in that first that that first i don't know how do you call it a brood litter i don't know yeah for yeah or clutch yeah clutch um, okay the first, uh, as far as the lightnings, I want to say we produced like 15 or 20 out of maybe, uh, it was about half of the fish were lightnings and half weren't. So I see. Yeah. And then those were the ones that were auctioned and those are the ones that went for, uh, I think there was a pair or a single fish sold for $10,000 or something. Um, yeah. So, so it worked out uh, for you in the end. It, it did. It did, but it was a big risk. And uh, all that money went into repairing home damage we had to do <laughs> for a winter storm. So uh, it's not like I got wealthy off of it or anything. Yeah, but the uh, next one with the wife is so much easier now. Yeah, if I ever do that again, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, huh, peppermint angels. I think I can yeah, do that. Not, I, would, I would, Well, so peppermints, you know, you would start any any breeding project, really. You want to do something like that. You want to breed gem tangs? You got two ways to go. You can go invest a ton of money in gem tangs, or you can invest a little money in something like a scopus, and learn how to breed Scopus, and then if you can breed Scopus, great. You know how to do it. Gem's going to be really similar. Now spend the money on gems. Um, so that's kind of still got to spend the money at some point, though. Yeah, at some point, yes. <laughs> but you can, you can learn on something less expensive. Now the well, flip they're already side, breed, Aren't they already breeding? What's the the, the same uh, the same kind of angelfish as the um, as a peppermint? The striped multi bar. Multi bar. And of course, of course. You're going to try to breed multibar first because, as you know, they're hard to keep alive. So if you can breed multibars, you're learning on an inexpensive fish. You're taking your losses on an inexpensive fish. So you're figuring out all your husbandry problems and refining everything on the inexpensive version so that when you're spending 25 grand on a fish, you, you're comfortable. So since they already – I mean they already are pretty, doing the multibars pretty successfully, right? Uh, I wouldn't say pretty successfully. I'd say there's been a handful here and there. Um I think the the biggest shocker to me is how well yellow tangs have been commercialized in the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, we're not seeing a flood of multi bar captive bred multi bars um, 
uh, available in every corner. Whereas, you know, finding a captive bred Navarcus or a majestic angel, uh, Bally Oporich is producing a lot of those. Um, and who, you know, who would have thought? But, you know, it takes time. Like this fish right here, I'm going to product placement right there. Mm-hmm. Um, I have mine. So that's the, that's the world's first captive bred regal angel Ooh. fish. We, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, but that, that captive bred regal, I think, was the only one. And it, it's not like Wen Ping Su has come out with uh, a, a bunch more uh-huh. and been like, here, now we've got hundreds of them. Uh, it takes time. Uh, and I think uh, Ta, uh, Tom at Biota would really, you know, harp on that. And Chad Callum would too, which is, you know, making that. that um, There's Tom. That, I just threw up Tom's picture. So Tom uh, Tom won the uh, Aquarist of the Year. Or I, what's it called now? I, I can't keep First his Mastin Award straight. Yeah, uh, Mastin Award is the former Aquarist of the Year, and now, of course, yeah, it's it's uh, complicated, but it's not. They just, there was... Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Tom, uh, and deservingly so, is raising lots of fish out uh, in uh, PNG, right? Papua New Guinea, right? No, uh, Palau. Uh, Palau, okay. And, oh, um, right. and to hey, his credit... You know, American, all the P islands and stuff, they're all the same, you know? Somewhere over there where the water's um, beautiful... Yes, the water is. I'm sure it's beautiful. I've and never lots been. Lots of flies but that probably bite you. I think. I think what I like about what Tom is doing with Biota is he's starting to work a lot with other uh, entities like um, Chad Callen at Oceanic Institute, and they just announced that they're bringing in Ballyocarich fish to go through uh, through Biota aquariums. And I think that's you know it kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier about competition versus collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, there's being willing to work with fellow producers is really vital to pushing breeding as a whole to the next level. So, uh, so I, my hat's off to Tom for that. So with that in mind, um, that's a pretty good segue. So how – back to the, the ugly fish, the freshwater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to have people just kill me. Just be like sending me hate mail. They're no, probably they already on here going, oh, Yeah. Um, but uh, back to the, uh, you know to the breeding, the aquatics trade, um, you know from what you've gathered, and because I know you obviously read a lot more on this than I do, in the freshwater side, what's the percentage of stuff that's bred versus what it comes from the wild as a whole? I mean, so I know we don't have exact numbers of no. any of this, but what's the intuition here? What's the the general feel? The figures are roughly inverted, so. The, people like to say that 10% of marine fish are captive bred now, and it's only uh, 10% of freshwater fish are still wild caught now. Um, so most By the number sold, at, right? Yeah. So so it's it's interesting because we probably harvest more wild freshwater fish than we do yes. saltwater fish, but they're not coming off of coral reefs, and uh, right. they're they're ugly brown fish, right? They're ugly so. brown fish. <laughs> exactly. Nobody cares about. Everybody cares about Nemo and Dory. And, and all of those, so, yeah. They, they grab more attention, so that's, I mean, the reality is, is all these fisheries can be done sustainably um, if the proper management's in place. I'm not here to say who or what that is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the freshwater trade, and that was kind of pointing to that article that we put into the, um, the MACNA program mm-hmm. uh, this year and kind of looking where the next 30 years are going to be. It seems like there's going to be an, ev- an, an, an inevitable shift towards more and more captive bred marine fish, cultured coral. That just seems to be the way it's going to go. Uh, I know Vincent said it's inevitable. Uh, I kind of have felt that way for a long time and have written that way for a long time. Um, it, and it's just I looking to, at the I tend to agree right? with you as well. I think it's unfortunate because it's going to there, there's definitely going to be a price penalty there. Um, well, and, and breeders need breeders need broodstock. That's the one thing no one seems to ever really acknowledged uh, I've, I was accused many years ago of being uh, against wild harvest because I wanted to make money being a breeder so I was supposedly going to condemn wild harvest <laughs> and I just like where am I supposed to get my brood stock from where where are these I'm going to breed this new fish or culture this new coral how am I supposed to get it if there's no wild harvest it's not real it's not a realistic thing so I am going to always advocate for good wild harvest that's done sustainably uh kevin cohen has really hit home the need of short supply chain and the benefits of that um breeders need fish we can't just operate in a vacuum so you know if you want to end up with maybe 200 species of fish well sure shut down wild caught fish today we'll all be really hurting and bored um that's not the solution 
Um, well, I mean, it, I mean, but yeah, you need brood stock, but somebody. Well, there's it. there's certain fish like peppermints. You know, it, it's a diver risking his life to catch a peppermint. Oh, absolutely, no so doubt. So maybe maybe that diver gets his reward for you know a dozen, a couple dozen peppermints, right. and then we get those cultured, and they still are able to fetch an insane amount of money and make a breeder. Uh, a breeding operation profitable, which it, it does need to be. Um, but that's a fish that maybe we shouldn't have to go back and harvest or once in a blue moon, hey, we need some we need some bird stock. Let's do one targeted collection trip. Go get that fish uh, to an, infuse some fresh genetics. But when we talk about that, the generation time is on a clownfish, just as an example, is 20 years. Um, you really don't have to inbreed saltwater fish. They live a long time. Uh, it's different on the freshwater side. Now, there's some exceptions like gobies, but um, we can do with a lot less wild harvest and still be okay as breeders, but we need access. Sure, of course. So how many how many peppermint shrimp do I need to get to you so that you can start your breeding program? I'm not peppermint shrimp? No, thanks. I'm oh, not peppermint shrimp. Peppermint <laughs> angel. Sorry, I said peppermint shrimp. So. I'm, not, I'm not ready to breed peppermints. Um, I'm working on uh, the corallivores. I'm working on... Uh, coral feeding butterflies. Somebody so drops like, six peppermint shrimps in your uh, peppermint shrimp. I keep searching peppermint shrimps. It's in my head. Peppermint <laughs> angels in your lap, six of them, and you're gonna be like, no, I don't want to breed those. Uh, I would, I would be saying I am not the person for those fish. Ah, that's okay. what I would say. I would say they need to go to someone like a Karen Britton or uh, Wenping Su, someone who's, or, you know, well, someone who's got the experience breeding angelfish. Um, it's not an easy learning curve and you don't want to screw it up. So right now, if I was picking, it would be, you know, someone who's doing them already. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe Biota can, can be doing them there. Um, they're doing really well with some of their angelfish breeding. So angelfish breeding is kind of like the next big wave. And we just saw this week, um, or announced that they are in that game. Now they are producing uh, cherub fish and coral beauties, uh, in limited quantities, but there's going to be more. That's what they are saying. So, um, that's the next pelag that's the next hurdle that I think we're seeing because everyone can breed clownfish. Um, and so when everyone can do it, it's really hard to sell it. And when you make 800 clownfish in a month and then you're like, where do, where do yeah, these it's go? It's a supply and demand problem. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Yeah, and then it does, so and then it does become, you know, who can afford to acquire the broodstock, put the risk into it and see the reward, you know, down the road. Uh, of having that, you know, of uh, yeah. of the peppermint angel, like yeah, it's you know, I'm gonna need six of them to guarantee I can get a pair that's gonna match up or whatever it is. You're like, okay, it's 150 G's, okay, we'll put that out there, but we can easily sell, you know, 25 of these, you know, for 11 grand a piece, right away. Yeah, and make know? a killing. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I've got some yeah. questions. You know, first of all, I want to uh, I want to say that uh, you're popular, man. Even Thank Kevin you. Erickson has come on the live stream, okay? The great Kevin Erickson has come on and says, I wish I was cool as Matt Peterson. Nice. <laughs> nice, huh? Thank you, Kevin. I'd have him on here if he had something to talk about. <laughs> Kevin always has something to talk about, man. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, Kevin. Yeah, I know. Oh. Uh, Amanda Mackley, Mackley says, we have a pair of gem tangs. So I don't know, if, I don't know what I she know means by that. Well, she, I, I get, I, are they spawning, Amanda? I mean, that's, you know, that, that's my next question. I mean, uh, the fact that they get along in school. Steve but, Simon you know, says, screw the World Series. So much more entertaining. Yeah, that was a nice compliment. Thank you, Steve. I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. And then uh, there is a question. So I do have an interesting question. Something about, tell us more about the Florida algae eating fairy wrasse from Spike Bose asked this question. Oh, uh, Yes. Yes, I love that. So that is a Sparisoma atomarium. It's a it's called the green blotch parrotfish, and so it's it's not a uh, I don't not have a fairy that. wrasse. Then it's a parrotfish. No, it's it's a fairy wrasse because it's a little parrotfish that's you know two three inches long and it's pink and red like a fairy wrasse. So okay. uh, I like to joke it's the algae eating fairy wrasse out of Florida because it's a little parrotfish that eats algae, stays small. Um, it's a fish that uh, when I was setting up that uh, 92 gallon Gorgonian tank that I think some people have seen with the Ikea fixtures above it. Uh, that was a, a Florida biotope tank. And I was looking for interesting fish to put in it. And both Tony Vargas and Julian Sprung almost simultaneously said, Hey, 
have you ever seen the green blotch parrotfish? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and uh, like I said, it's this little parrotfish from the Keys. Um, eats algae, leaves corals alone. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just really cool. It's a fish. It's one of those fish that it's out there. No is one it in was, the, is it in the trade. I mean, can you can you buy one at you know at your pet store? Uh, it, no. Uh, you would have to go to can't, can't go to Petco and pick one up. Mm -mm, no way. Um, they are uh, only collected by a couple of collectors in Florida. Um, the reason he's asking is I wrote an article about it for Reef Hobbyist magazine ah. uh, recently. I've put them in coral in the past, um, and then uh, was just talking and they said, "Hey, what, plug, what's something?" Coral magazine. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, I just said, you know, I've, I've written about this already, but I could give a fresh take. And so it's just this awesome little fish. I, I don't have a picture handy, but. Um, Maybe I can post one up later on okay. the on the uh, Facebook feed. Um, but yeah, it, it maxes out at like three to four inches. It's a it's a hermaphrodite, you know. Um, so the males turn completely different. Uh, they're kind of green with red fins, red eyes. Um, KP Aquatics it. is I like the uh, fish. It, it's a really cool fish. Um, and they spawn in captivity. I've spawned them. I've hatched them. I've not reared them. It's one of my target fish to go try again at some point. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, they were the way I would know they were spawning in my display tank was I'd be sitting there in the morning, and the ones in the display spawn in the morning. The ones downstairs spawn at night. I have no idea why, um, but they would be hitting the glass, the cover glass, because they rock it up into the uh, water column, and then they would just fly straight out. And um, so cool. And just it, it's one of those fish that hey, everything down in Florida um, has kind of fallen under the radar lately, and I think. Uh, there's so many cool fish right in our own backyard, and they're generally less expensive. Um, we're, we have a the new coral, which I sent you some uh, inside sneak pictures of that no one's seen yet. Um, the Gorgonian issue. Oh, uh, I think that's the one I didn't put in. You didn't tell me that one was special. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so the the next issue, we're going to talk about Gorgonian keeping, and I've got an online uh, bonus that will go on the line in the next week or so. Um, really go, just running down all those Florida gorg Gorgonians. I mean, it's just we're all stuck on colored sticks. Why not colored sticks that wave in the wind? I like and, them. You know? I like them. I know yeah. Julian loves those things, and he has tons of them in his tank. They look beautiful. And, and that's so – there's so much diversity out there. The the Florida eating – the Florida's algae-eating fairy wrasse is just my tongue-in-cheek. I forgot. I got this wait. little name drop thing. Whenever you, whenever you name drop, you're supposed to hit the name drop thing, but I don't think it's working right now. Oh, I've name dropped a whole bunch. So. No, I know, but I'm supposed to have this little little bell, and it goes ding. <laughs> credit. Where, I am I am a firm believer in credit where credit is due. So right. Yes. So uh, another question, um, and I'll kind of augment this. Jake Speed asks, what fish was the hardest to breed, or is the hardest to breed? And I'll say, I'll I'll augment his question a little bit to say, what fish that has been successfully bred, okay, is was the hardest. In other words, like most stages or the foods or whatever it might be. Tanks. At this point, tangs, maybe wrasses, but probably tangs. And they are really, they are really working that problem scientifically and methodically. And the proof is in particular. I mean, are zebra somas harder than you know another? I, it's impossible to say. I mean, we're, we're up the, the the list now. We're up to five species of tangs that have been bred. Uh, we added. I mean, that's all just in the last couple of years. But that negates. To say it happened, you know, there, there were people like Sid Crawl who were working on it for 20 years and were getting, you know, 40 or 50 days out and having these well-developed larval tangs, but they just couldn't get further. And that went on for, you know, decades. So I just look at the amount of work it took to get over that hump and how close the the aggregate pe the collection of marine fish breeders was for so long. And then it just took that one little breakthrough and then sharing that breakthrough. And now we have uh, a lot more. Um, but that's, you know, that tanks. Yeah. Another question for you says, uh, Derek Picker says, do you have a coral tank r right now or only freshwater? <laughs> oh no, I have saltwater. Uh, I sent you a picture of the vase reef. That is my reef tank. Yeah. Let me show um, that. Hang on a second. So one of the, one of the questions I actually have here too, I'll, that's kind of a segue into that as well. I showed your family obviously, uh, up front, right? Yep. Let's yep. see if I can find this. So here's the, uh, so I'm showing the article right now that has the uh, editor's page on it that, that kind of shows that that uh, that bowl. And then the first picture here I've got uh, with the bowl on it. So 
How involved, first of all, before we talk about this vase uh, reef that we have here, um, how involved has your little kids, because how old are your kids right now? My kids are now nine and six. So are, do they have any interest in the breeding things or any of these things that, you, that, that really have uh, been of super interest to you? Um, not entirely, no. Yeah, my son's the same way. It's like, yeah, oh yeah, I, I like looking at the fish once in a while, but has really no interest in the rest of it. Well, my, my son, Ethan, asked recently, uh, last couple months, hey, could I like try to breed clownfish? And I was like, absolutely, man. We got a whole base <laughs> set it up. If you want to do it, let's yes. do it. Uh, and then that's as far as it went. Um, yeah. You know, my, my daughter, I think, is more into the fish. Um, she constantly complains that I took the aquarium that I had in her room out and I replaced it with some dart frogs. And she always asks, can I have the, uh, can I have the, the can tank have the fish back? back? Yeah. So, um, so the, the, the vase, so I've got the first picture up, which is her at, at what age? Um, um, uh, not seeing which one it was. Uh, the first the, one, the first picture I think is when she's younger than the second picture, right? Yeah. So I think, uh, she was probably five in that one and six or close to six in the next one. So, yeah, so the what was the inspiration down, for this, this vase tank? Uh, Mary Arroyo, uh, Maritza. Um, that Maritza vase reef that's been all over the place. Um, she's been keeping that little tiny tank for like four or five years. And I kind of, a couple of my friends had done similar things. I kind of realized, wait, there's something interesting about this here. Um, and there's a different methodology and thought process behind running these really tiny. I mean, it holds a gallon and a quarter of water. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's the opposite. It's the antithesis of the big 425 gallon, uh, you know, tank. It's, uh, ultra low maintenance, ultra low. Uh, well, I wouldn't say low maintenance. I should take that back. You're supposed to do a weekly hundred percent water change. Um, it just flips a lot of the things we think about corals in a different direction for me in my lifestyle and my budget. This is the perfect reef tank. I love it. Uh, everything grows. I have no problems with it. Um, the, it's interesting. You'll like this, Terrence. The, the most important and most expensive stuff on that is the controller for the heater because it's such a tiny space yes. of water. And I live in Duluth, Minnesota. It, it's already uh, – we've already had our first snow. Oh. It's going to be really cold. So I have to have a really good heater and a really good controller on that heater so that it keeps the temperature in that vase very stable. Yeah. The only other thing in that vase is – uh, an air feed to circulate the water. So That's you have it. an air stone in there, you have a rock with, you know, a live rock, right? A piece of live rock. Yep. And you got a bunch of corals. I saw in the, um, in the picture, I'll put the, the big picture up again. I see that there's yep. uh, some, some sort of like the, what would be called a candy coral and some, looks like some Duncans and. Yep. There's like a, a, there's Postalopora, yeah. a lot of Postalopora, and that's even uh, spawned in the tank at this point. And I've had, uh, written a blog about that for coral. Um, uh, there's uh, bubblegum digi, uh, uh, ore green bird's nest. There's um, there you can see right in front of my daughter's nose this anemone that's got a big round disc with uh, tentacles. That's a weird anemone that no one knows what it is that uh, I actually got from Tal Sweet, and uh, mm. it, it doesn't take over the tank. It does propagate slowly. It's kind of cool and different. Um, and uh, there's a big red gani down in the in the bottom that's done fantastic. You can't see it. But behind all that, in the backside, is a beautiful green gani. Um, not everything is done perfect in this tank. Uh, Acroporas uh, grew, but then got killed by the post lapora, and I've right. kind of just left it go. Um, I think part of what I like about this, uh, and I would encourage anyone to just throw one up in their fish room, you can have it as your own little personal ark. Uh, all your favorite precious corals put this little tiny Pico tank in the fish room. So when it totally collapses and dies on you in your display tank, you might have a piece of it in that little, uh, that little Good base. Idea. So, um, you know, but I got to ask you from a husbandry perspective for that, because I know this is what people are going to be thinking. Okay. So you have to do like a hundred percent water change on it. Yep. Right. Every and week. so your, all of your cal calcium carbonate basically comes from the water change, right? All every, of your every, trace elements, all of that. One big um, reset button. What about the what about nutrients getting locked into the the live rock or? Well, so the way I do it, um, I take and I drain it all down, and I usually have two gallons of uh, well aged mixed up salt water. Some people just even use those pre uh, the wild salt water um, mm -hmm. because it's so little. Um, it's not that expensive, but uh, you just have to have it the same temperature, same salinity. Just drain it down, and then when I pour in the new salt water. 
every, all the detritus comes out. So I'll fill it up about halfway and drain it down again. Ah. Fill it up halfway, drain it down again, and then fill it, and it's fine. Ah. And then because, because of the way it is, there's very little evaporation because it's got that lid on it. So um, I, I might need to throw in a little RODI once in a while in between. But for the most part, uh, you feed it a few hours before you do the water change, and you're good for another week. Um, I've put fish in there. I've put little tiny nano gobies, mm-hmm. and they'll last for a while. Uh, I had a nice uh, a, a blue coral banded shrimp. Um, but I think either the uh, the Duncans have gotten them or... Oh, yeah. There's just not uh, a lot of place to move, and there's a lot of stuff that's there to eat other things. Yeah, so so really, in the end, I've kind of... You know, there's hermit crabs and uh, trochus snails in there that, that still function as cleanup crew. Um, Do they spawn little, in there? Because those things are notorious for just spawning like crazy. I, I have had I have had hermits spawn in there. Absolutely, I haven't seen any uh, baby trochus, but I've oh, had hermits spawn. I've had the um, and I've had the postalopora put babies all over the tank. Um, and so that that's one of the fears is, hey, is this going to end up being this postalopora mess um, down the line? But it, it might also be a really Maybe. interesting way for someone to try an MPS tank to do on a really small scale. To culture things like uh, you know dendros and tubastreas and uh, or tubastreas, uh, you know the, any of these things that need heavy feeding, well just feed the heck out of it and then do your water change. And do your water change. Very yeah. So what's the temperature you keep it at? Seventy-eight. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so you 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 briefly talked about MBI. What is MBI? MBI is Marine Breeding Initiative. Um, and it's basically, at this point, the primary thing it does is every year it holds a, an annual conference, um, gathers 50 to 75 people from around the country, and even people from outside of the country, uh, Canada, Australia, who will come. And it's a conference dedicated to nothing other than the topic of marine ornamental fish and invert breeding. Um, that is what it is in a nutshell. We have a really good website. Um, they're rolling out a new update to it. We have a lot of spawning report capabilities. There is a scoring component system to it uh, for friendly competition. But if I'm honest, I think the, the number one thing that the MBI does is has a, a conference. And we're going to move it next year. That's the plan. I can't say anything else. I, I asked. I was told, nope, not yet. Okay. So it's uh, it's been for the last 10 years, it's been in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. So- is this something and, that costs like thousands of dollars to go attend or? No, no. It's, I, I think it's like 40 bucks to walk in the door and okay. it's always a really good raffle. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is if you're into marine fish breeding, you're going to sit. I, I, I remember doing a, uh, another interview with someone at the event and like, Hey, the guy who bred the first Anthias is sitting right there at that table. And right next to him is the guy who bred the first, uh, you know, basslets. And then over here is the guy who pioneered, uh, copepod culturing. It's just like, Everyone's right there. It's uh, a who's it's a, who. It's a who's who of marine fish breeding, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and but it's it's not like we're snobby people who are like, oh, we don't know who you are. You can't show up. Know, so, it sounds like a bunch of people over my pay grade. I don't know. It's like I don't know uh, I to go in there. Everybody's fish- talking about nopali <laughs> and this and that, and I just be like, ah, oh. no. No, I think I think anyone who has interest can come, and it's an accessible thing. And you know, there there are everyday hobbyists there. Who are I'll just say peppermint wanting... shrimp when I mean peppermint angel, and then everybody will laugh. Well, no, because everyone will be like, oh, well, here's how you breed peppermint shrimp, and they'll tell you. <laughs> and I'd say, what for? Because they're like gazillions of them. Well, it's, it's interesting because it, this is a little-known side tangent, but um, there is a big need for captive-bred animals for zoological institutions and public aquariums because AZA um, gives them bonus points. That, I'll just put it that way. Uh, if the animals aren't sourced from the wild – they are ranked higher. So it may seem silly to me or you that someone's breeding tons of grunts uh, because who's buying grunts to put in their reef tanks? No, they're going to the public aquarium trade. Um, they're, you know, Things like uh, look downs and trevallis, they're buying that stuff up because they need it because they need the captive bred stock to show that they're making efforts. That's what, better AZA, rats, yeah, that's what AZA has, has mandated. That So we run a reef tank at the zoo um, here, our club does, and uh, you've helped out, by the way. Thank you for that. You've sponsored that many I times did. over. Neptune Systems did. Neptune, yes, Neptune Systems did. You just you facilitated. Thank you. Um, yes, you are welcome. And, it's uh, a good cause. That uh, that tank, a hundred thousand people walk by that tank every year on a good year, and um, everything in that tank is captive propagated except for the one naso tank that's like eighteen years old and has lived at the zoo forever. So 
uh, that's and there's a big you know there's a big educational component to that display about talking about what's going on in the reefs in the wild and and yeah. so that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Just uh, it's a, it's an interesting thing to to realize that yeah, you and I might not really care about captive red peppermint shrimp. They're ubiquitous in the wild. It's going to be really hard to over harvest them, but there is still a need or a place for that. So. So speaking of captive bread, okay, um, one of my favorite videos I'm going to pull up na- now, um, and uh, uh, hear your thoughts about it. Oh, you're, you're, okay. It's, <laughs> it's, so what we're looking at, you're on a little bit of a delay, so I'll describe it, and then you'll see it. We're looking at some clownfish in the tank, and now we're looking at some Dr. Seuss fish, and then we're seeing them eat clownfish. Yes, yes, Rich's video. Uh, I know this, this is a, this well. is a Rich Ross, famous Rich Ross video that he shows all the time. So he can get a lot of reaction out of the out of the audience. So but, any any opportunity you have to pull it up, you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just think it's the funniest thing ever because it 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 really demonstrates the emotional nature of what it is that we do, and it also demonstrates if it's got that much emotional nature for people in the know or should be in the know here. What does everything else we do look like to those who don't know? And I kind of like to think that we need to keep that in mind all the time. We have to keep in mind yes. that everybody doesn't understand why we do other things. And so, you know, a video like that, a lot of people would say, don't do that because other people are going to think the wrong way. But Richard uh, Ross, I think, has the right idea, which is, that, you know, you have to have a much broader understanding uh, for these things. And those are clownfish culls. Those are fish yeah. that are going to end up dead anyway. They're going to end up just you know, in the garbage, basically, and why not use those properly fed fish uh, for, you know, for food for another animal? I mean, that, that's one of the things that breeders, aspiring first-time breeders have a really hard time with is this whole notion of culling. Um, right. The fact that not every baby fish is going to be an acceptable representative of the species. It's not going to, you know, there's going to be something wrong with it. And it, it, it gets culled, and culling means it gets destroyed in one fashion or another. There's no reason it shouldn't become food and part of the captive but natural food web um, for a pair of Dr. Seuss fish. That's right. perfectly acceptable. That's a great use of those fish. Right. Um, you know, it's uh, there's certainly a whole other topic about the ethical ways to hu- humanely uh, euthanize or put down a fish. Getting eaten by sure. a predator is generally regarded as more or less acceptable. Um, but that's that's one thing that if you can't stomach the fact that you might have to put some baby fish down, I mean, it's a, going back to what we, we were talking about at the beginning. I want you to think about your own reef tank and how many fish are spawning in that at night that you probably don't even realize. Right. Um, I remember sitting here with uh, Frank uh, uh, Watruba looking at his 300 gallon reef tank in his basement in Duluth. And we were just I was there at his house late one day and uh, we were talking about. You know, hey, you ever see anything spawning? He's got a pair of uh, Watanabes and a pair of Regals and a, a couple different types of Antheas. And just while we're sitting there spawning, all the fish start eating. And I, and I said, oh, someone just spawned. And Frank's like, what? And uh, we sat there a little longer, and then the Watanabes spawned, and then the other Antheas spawned. And that's all just gametes and baby fish floating away and getting eaten. That's perfectly natural. So Yeah, I think I, I – you know, the funny thing in my own aquarium, I – I often think I'm seeing spawning, but I don't even know what spawning looks like. So I'm like, hey, did those just spawn? Because they did something really weird, <laughs> you know? One of the dead giveaways for me was always when the fish start eating and I have and I didn't feed. That's always the, the, the clue. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like laying on your back on a super dark night and seeing things move through the sky. It's like, is that a satellite? I don't know. Maybe it is. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so what makes you what what are you most passionate about today? I know you got other things that you're doing lately that aren't directly fish related, but fish related and non fish related. What makes you passionate? We'll we'll close on some of that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, we mentioned in in the bio that you put out there that I am a senior editor and publisher for Coral. Um, that is, uh, I've been doing that since 2011, and then in uh, late 2011 we we launched the Ugly Fish version, Amazon, <laughs> and. Uh, um, so like I said, I don't discriminate. Amazonas is what it's called, right? Yes, Amazonas. It's uh, it's actually named uh, Ama- Here, let's turn it that way. Amazonas. It's named for the Brazilian state Amazonas. Um, okay. Those have to be the have most part- beautiful freshwater fish I've ever seen on that cover. You must have to look far and wide for those fish. 
There, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, so I, uh, I that was actually how I started working with, uh, with with James and Judy. I've got the utmost respect for them and Reef the Rainforest. Um, I had written a few things for Coral, and when I uh, was laid off from my job, James said, "Hey, you're looking for work?" I said, "Yeah." He's like, "How how would you like to help me launch Amazonas?" I had seen it at Macna a year before and said, "This is beautiful." Um, this is like the freshwater version of coral. So mm -hmm. I said, of course you should do this. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, then uh, about a year ago, um, Stefan Tanner, Mike Tuchinardi, and myself took over. And so now that is – I'm one of the three publishing partners of Amazonas. Um, so I'm still that – is, that is my daily in and out. That is my lifeblood is those two okay. magazines. Um, I, I have Mini Waters, which is uh, – Kind of the wholesale re slash retail. So you're uh, you're and you're. It's not just fish, right? You do fish, but I'm like I'm. Well, let me pull up this other one here. I think I got. Sure. You've got. I, I wrote in my list here some clown. I don't know what that <laughs> is. It's it's not the one I showed you before, but it looks like some maroon clown or something. No, no, no. That's that's begonia breverimosa. That's a uh, a terrarium plant. Uh, very difficult to keep. No, no, no. The clownfish first. Oh, I didn't see the clownfish. I only saw the. Ah, uh, yeah, that clownfish. That uh, that Clarkie clownfish is a uh, a black Australian Clarkie that's actually produced by Sustainable Aquatics. Uh, they had the foresight when those fish came through to establish a good captive population of those. So that's a fish that I generally resell. Um, and uh, I like I like fish that are off the beaten path a little bit. That's a fish that you know most people are so sucked into the designer clowns, but that black Aussie Clarkie is way way more interesting to me. Um, than some of these other fish, and it's probably an undescribed species. Um, it's, it's, a, it's one of the things I've written about in the past, uh, this whole biogeographic diversity of clownfish. Sure. Um, there's like 50 varieties of clownfish in the wild, and I don't think most people even know that. You know, We talk about there's 2,000 fish, but man, most people are keeping the same couple hundred fish, uh, and there's a lot more out there than that. So. And then um, you got uh, frogs or something that you're doing? I am doing dart frogs and uh, uh, vivarium plants, and I kind of got suckered into this by a fellow fish breeder. Um, uh, he he had some dart frogs at his house, and uh, I always we watch each other's fish rooms. He's four blocks away from me. Um, he breeds clownfish, um, and he said, "Hey, take care of my. Uh, can you take care of my frogs while while uh, while I'm gone? You're already taking care of the fish." I said, "Sure, show me." Um, long story short, it's really easy. A lot less headache. So uh, I kind of got suckered into a little bit, but I'm also a plant nut. Uh, I used to run the website, still own the website, slipperorchid.com. I used to sell orchids and breed orchids. Um, and this was just like, uh, you know, hey, man, you like heroin, try some crack. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I've given some of my space over to, uh, to the vivarium hobby. It's just the terrestrial version of a reef tank. Um, I, I love saltwater fish. I love freshwater fish. I just love living things. I like um, the vivarium thing. We have, uh, we, I know there's some, uh, there's a product that's going to be coming out pretty soon using our stuff for the vivarium stuff. I don't remember the exact name off the top of my head. I'll give it a plug. Very on another, exciting. On another show, I'll give it another plug. But anyway, we're going to close this one down, man. And, you know, I really right. appreciate you coming on. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Absolutely. The I hope everybody out there, uh, you know, really uh, enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions to, before we close it down because I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Um, Mm -mm. Oh, one last question. You got to keep it short, though. Okay. So from Steve Simon says, Matt, do you also keep anemones? Curious being is that they have a symbiotic relationship with clowns. Are they important in the breeding process? Not at all. There you uh, go. That's a nice yeah. short answer. No. On that, we're uh, going to close this couple, one down. A couple what? species need them. A couple species benefit from them, but other than that, no. no. Okay. Well, thanks again, guys, for joining us here with, uh, with Matt for Let's Talk Reef. Again, in two weeks, we'll have another Let's Talk Reef, the reef two weeks from today. Next week, we will do another uh, Control Freak Wednesday, so I hope you join us for that. That's at 3.30 in the afternoon Pacific time. Um, until the next one, you know, thanks for joining us, and, you know, enjoy those fish for that person that doesn't like me saying that. <laughs>